Hello and welcome to Bandwidth Conversations, a podcast that finds out about the stories and journeys of rock stars of life. I am Katie Brewer and my guest today worked in the British diplomatic service for nearly 40 years. He served his country in Lebanon, France, Luxembourg, Australia, Vanuatu, Spain, and served as a British ambassador to Yugoslavia during the Balkans War, was posted as ambassador to Ireland immediately following the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, and finally served as ambassador to Italy. During that time, and among many roles, he was sent to deal with a rebellion, was involved in the complex and delicate negotiations of releasing hostages, and served as the Foreign Office's head of counterterrorism. His memoir of his years in the Balkans, Conversations with Milosevic, was published in 2016. After a glittering career, he became president of Trinity College, Oxford. I'm looking forward to hearing about some of his extraordinary experiences in and perspectives on the countries in which he lived and worked. And I am so excited to have the opportunity to talk today to Sir Ivor Roberts, KCMG. Hello, Ivor. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Katie. When you grew up in Liverpool, what were you like as a child? I think I was quite lonely in a way. I was an only child. I think in a sort of days with no television initially, uh, very little social interaction. I had a very quiet childhood, I think. Uh, I read a lot. I didn't socialize a huge amount. I mean, I changed when I was a, became a kind of older teenager. But otherwise, no, I had a fairly restrained, quiet life. Well, you excelled at school and then you went on to Keble College, Oxford to study modern languages. How did you enjoy your time there? I think as for many people going to university and particularly to to Oxford was transformative, changed my life utterly. And the friends I made there, the closest friends I still have nearly 60 years later. No, it was hugely exciting. I think it was an exciting time, the mid 60s, uh, to be an a young person. All sorts of things were changing. I came from Liverpool, which became was very fashionable as the home of the Beatles. I had a girlfriend shortly after I arrived in Oxford who was fascinated by my Liverpool accent and uh, used to parade me around parties and gently poke me and say, say something, say something, Ivor. So I'd say something and she's She would say, see, he sounds just like George Harrison, doesn't he? (laughs) (laughs) You've lost that along the way. Yes. Well, I've lived in so many countries, nine countries, I suppose, and Liverpool. Liverpool's a long, long time ago, but I'm still hugely, hugely fond of Liverpool. And it was said that professors would be on the lookout for students when they were at Oxford or Cambridge to see whether they might be suited to be spies or to be members of the Foreign Office. Were you spotted? No, nobody ever suggested I do anything. The one thing I wasn't worried about was getting a job because in that time, given the fact only, I don't know, seven or eight percent of the population went to university, the idea of graduate unemployment was absolutely unknown. There was no problem. Everyone was going to get a job, just depended what. But I was never talent spotted by anyone to do anything. And I think what led me into the Foreign Office was, well, the fact I was studying modern languages, which doesn't offer a huge number of career openings, but obviously points the way towards something international. And I knew I really didn't want to spend my life working in the city in finance or catching the 812 from Surbiton to Waterloo every morning. And I wanted something different. And, and that's what a career in the Foreign Office gave me. Well, yes, it certainly did. Because you're, and I think I'm right in saying that your first stop was Lebanon, which is definitely a long way away from the 812 to, <laughs> to wherever. Um, and it's a country that was caught up in civil war in between 1975 and 1990, during which time 104 foreign hostages were kidnapped. You were there at the end of the 60s. So that was 20 years after Lebanon's independence from France and in the run up to all of this. Can you give us a flavor of what? Lebanon at the end of the 1960s was like? Well, it was already starting to fall apart. It wasn't a full-scale civil war, but there was enormous tension. And the main street in Beirut is called Rue Hamra. And in my time there, bombs were going off in Rue Hamra. It's like you know, the bombs going off in Regent Street or something. The tensions between Palestinians and Israelis were very palpable. 
And so, I mean, I certainly wasn't surprised when when it developed into a full scale war. And quite a lot of the time I was in Lebanon, there was uh, a curfew uh, you know, that six o'clock everyone was supposed to be off the streets. So everyone thinks that the 60s were a time when Beirut was prosperous, like the sort of Paris of um, Levant, but it wasn't. It was very beautiful and it was a sort of place where you could ski in the snows of the cedars of Lebanon in the morning and swim in the Mediterranean in the afternoon. But there were all sorts of things going badly wrong. I wasn't in the embassy. I was uh, I was learning Arabic. The Foreign Office had a language school that they'd set up shortly after the war in a village outside Beirut, a village called Shamlan in the Shouf Mountains above Beirut. We lived in the college, so I was locked in um, as though I were at boarding school. But you know, there was plenty to do in terms of we had our own social life within the, the language school. It's called the Middle East Center for Arab Studies, or MECAS, as its acronym was pronounced. There was also a lot of work to do. Arabic is not an easy language. Before we move on away from Lebanon and jumping forward, because one of the most high profile hostages was Terry Waite, and he spent five years as a hostage between 87 and 91, four of which were in solitary confinement, chained to a table. And he had been sent a special envoy to secure the release of other British hostages. And given your understanding of of the situation, was this always a doomed mission? Not necessarily, but he took some very, very high risks. This is moving forward by nearly 20 years. I went to the Lebanon in 1969, and I became head of counterterrorism in the Foreign Office in 1986. And he went missing within a month of my taking over. Not The two events were not entirely connected, I'd like to point out. <laughs> yes. but, but he had been warned that it was very dangerous for him to come back at that time, and that we strongly advised him, A, not to do so, and B, if he insisted on coming back, that he should rely on the security that was being offered him by the Druze sect. And um, one day he dismissed his bodyguards and walked out into the night for a meeting with a, with a, a Shia doctor. And he wasn't seen again for five years. And were you then part of those negotiations, Ivor, in terms of the release of the hostages? Well, we took a very different view that we shouldn't have any negotiations because we just felt that negotiating, and that would mean money passing hands, was just going to lead to more hostage taking. So although it sounded incredibly cruel and callous and heartless, our aim was to give the message to the hostage takers, don't take British hostages because we're not going to pay you any money for you to do so, to get them back. Some countries took a different approach. Some denied that they had done so, but we knew that some had done so. And uh, I think uh, there was always going to be a price to pay by getting into negotiations with them. I mean, we would talk to Shia leaders there was a man called um, Fadlala, who was the spiritual leader of the of Hezbollah, who were behind most of the hostage taking, and now they're they're in government in in Lebanon, but they were principally wanting to take hostages to um, secure the release of some of their friends and brethren in jail in Kuwait. So we weren't prepared to tell the Kuwaiti government to release um, these terrorists who'd been captured and held in prison in Kuwait. So there was no real deal to be done. We tried appealing to their better nature, but uh, that wasn't a great success. But that was no surprise. So in the time I was uh, I was head of counterterrorism, we, we just had to suck it, basically. Am I right in saying that Iran instigated the whole thing? I don't know that they'd instigated, but they certainly supported them actively, militarily. They provided them with arms. They provided them with succor. And they, their loyalties lay, of course, through shared Shia religion. And they were certainly very, very close. 
I, I remember one case of another uh, American, actually, hostage being taken, and we saw evidence from intelligence that Iran was on that occasion had been definitely involved in his seizure by his bullet. Skipping ahead to Vanuatu, very different. <laughs> yes. Vanuatu, for those who don't know, is a series of islands. It has a population of about 300,000, and it's in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean, southeast of Papua New Guinea, due east of Queensland. And the great majority of the population is Melanesian. It was granted independence in 1980, and you were serving as first secretary in Canberra at that time, and you were sent there as a political advisor during a rebellion. What was your role? Well, it was all very strange because um, I was the first secretary in the High Commission in Canberra, but uh, I was back in the UK on home leave. I hadn't had any leave for two years because that was the way it was in those days. Australia was a long way away, and we only got home leave every two years. So I came home and was in the middle of my leave, and suddenly the Foreign Office tracked me down. Free mobile phone days, of course. So. But we had to give them some indication of where we were hanging out. They tracked me down. They said, um, we need you to go to Vanuatu. I said, uh, where's that? They said, well, up to last weekend, it was known as the New Hebrides. Oh, I said, I've been there. They said, yes, that's why we're ringing you. And I said, so it's independent now. And they said, yes, that's right. As of last weekend, unfortunately, there's a civil war going on. And the new government has appealed to the former colonial powers, Britain and France, to come and sort out the civil wars. Otherwise, they're inheriting a country with a civil war going on, on on independence. So I said, well, when did you think that I might go out there? And they said, uh, well, we thought tomorrow. I said, um, oh, let me explain something. Um, we've just bought a house which we're moving into on Saturday. This conversation was taking place on Wednesday. I said, if I told my wife that I was, in fact, instead of helping the move with two little boys into this new house, I was leaving for Vanuatu, I think it could be divorce state. <laughs> so they said, uh, all right, well, when could you go? How about Sunday? I said, well, let me consult. So I rang my wife and I explained what was happening and said, uh, they want us to go out on Sunday. She said, which Sunday? I said, no, the Sunday, the day after we move in. Okay, she said, let's go for it. So we set off on the Sunday. Oh my goodness, so, so you did. So you did move in and then you left. We moved in on the Saturday. We left on Sunday for the most horrible journey, going Los Angeles, Honolulu, Fiji, New Caledonia, and finally New Vanuatu, ex New Hebrides. It took two days of solid traveling with a short break in Los Angeles where I dragged the children off to Disneyland to keep them amused. But one was <laughs> one was four and while the other one was just one. Oh my goodness. That's and ever, just... ever afterwards, whenever they suggested they might like to go to Disneyland, I said, You've been there. You've done it. <laughs> but with no memory of it. Well, that's tough. <laughs> yeah, it's done. It's done. Uh, so anyway, we got there, and um, my role, the, 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 the new high commissioner to the new state of Vanuatu, had never done a political job before, which is pretty unusual in the Foreign Office, but his career pattern had just been very different, commercial, information, press, and never politics, and still less the sort of military. So my job was really to deal with the advent of the British troops who arrived that week, the Royal Marine Commandos arrived, and um, the French sent the French paratroopers. Uh, most of the problems I then had to deal with were the re tense relations between the British and French military, <laughs> ra rather than dealing with the rebellion. But anyway, so the High Commissioner said, well, you, uh, you, you've you got experience in these things, you deal with it. So I did. After two months and endless bickering between the British and French military, uh, the new, new Vanuatu government said, I tell you what, why don't you lock leave and we'll get the Papua New Guinea military in? 
So we said, okay, we're not going to stay if we're not wanted. So we withdrew, our military withdrew, I withdrew back to Canberra, and the Papua New Guinea military arrived and sorted it all out in 48 hours. And end of rebellion. I think they were perhaps more direct in, and robust in their approach to the rebellion than we would have been. We're going to now move on to the, the Balkans. And I read your book, Conversations with Milosevic. And yes, it was so informative. It made me realize how unbelievably ignorant I was about the whole affair. And also what an impossible task you were you were set. And you were there as ambassador between 94 and 97. And you write in your book, Milosevic effectively provided one of the most demanding diplomatic and military challenges to diplomats, statesmen, and generals. Can you convey to us your sense of the man who ended up being known as the butcher of the Balkans? Yes. Very hard to summarize, really, what he was like. You met him a lot, didn't you? Maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50 times I met him. Sometimes very, very frequently, daily, if we were in the middle of an intense negotiation. Other times, weeks would might go by when I didn't see him at all. He was easier to deal with, strangely enough, than some of the Bosnian Serbs, because he was completely realistic in the sense he didn't believe in going in for historical diatribes, as Mladic, General Mladic did with me, or Karadzic, who wanted to explain to me how the Serbs were the guardians at the gate, keeping the Muslims out of Europe. Uh, none of this with Milosevic. You could get to the point very quickly, but he was a very tough negotiator. But the West had some cards to play, which was well, basically sanctions. We had imposed heavy sanctions on, on the country. And uh, if he cooperated, we would lift some of them, and ultimately all of them, if we got a peace deal. Um, so it was a question of continually chipping away at his initial approach and uh, persuading him that what I was suggesting was actually in his and his country's best interests, uh, to cooperate with the international community, to distance himself from the Bosnian Serbs, who would become a bit like Frankenstein's monster. and uh, he no longer had them fully under control, having created them, or at least been in at their birth. Yeah. I mean, the term ethnic cleansing was first used as a euphemism during those the Yugoslav wars. And in terms of ethnic cleansing, and particularly thinking about the massacre in Srebrenica, in your opinion, was Milosevic behind that, or was that a Karadzic or Mladic endeavour? We never found any evidence Milosevic was involved in Srebrenica. It wouldn't really have been logical for him to do so. He was in the middle of being the international statesman, if you like, that he was going to help bring peace to the region. And he was cooperating with the Western powers to, and the contact group of nations to bring it about. And for him to have been involved in Srebrenica would have been against his interests in that. No, it's not a question of him being soft-hearted. It's not, you know, not the question that he wouldn't have done that sort of thing. He was quite capable of doing that sort of thing. It just wouldn't, didn't make sense from his point of view. I think it was entirely organized and implemented by the Bosnian Serbs, the monsters he'd created in Radovan Karadzic and Bratko Mladic, his, uh, the general. And in fact, they've both been found guilty of it in um, international tribunal, criminal tribunals in The Hague. The term ethnic cleansing is, is, may have been a, a modern phrase, but it's not a modern concept. I mean, there have been examples of ethnic cleansing going back to ancient times. And you know, I think what happened to the American Indian indigenous peoples in America certainly a form of ethnic cleansing, and the same thing happened in parts of Australia with the Aborigines. It's not an unknown or new concept, but it was given a new horrible breath, breath of life, in, um, or death rather, in the Balkans in the 1990s. And one of the things that you had to deal with was the UN hostage crisis. The UN demanded Bosnian Serbs return heavy weapons that they'd removed from UN storage depots, and they wouldn't do that. 
So the UN bombed them and then the Bosnian Serbs took 400 UN troops hostage. Yeah, it was hundreds. I can't quite remember the exact number, but there were an awful lot of them. Well, I remember reading that you you were the one going out to negotiate their release. Were you worried for your own personal safety at that point? Well, I went to Bosnia itself. I crossed over from Serbia into Bosnia to talk to the Bosnian Serbs to get them to release them. And I threatened them with military action. Um, I said, you know, their health and safety was a prime national interest. And they said, what does that mean? I said, if any harm comes to them, we will treat it as an act of war. So they took that pretty seriously. Milosevic, meanwhile, whom I'd been to see separately, I'd said to him, you can use what influence you still have with the Bosnian Serbs to get them released because this is a stain on the whole Serbian nation. It would help your cause in wanting to burnish your credentials as a peacemaker if you were able to help secure the release. So he said he'd do what he could. He sent one of his top aides, head of national security, a man called Stanisic, you know, it's uh, Stanisic. And uh, he told me, I'm going to send Stanisic to see the Bosnian Serbs, and he should be able to affect some progress in getting the hostages released. I said, what makes you think that? He said, well, they'll be carrying a message for me. And I said, well, what's the message? He said, the message is, I'll have you killed if you don't release the, the UN hostages. So, so, that, so that worked. That seems to have worked. A combination of all this pressure led to them being released. And I went to see them in a town called Novi Sad, which is about 100 kilometers north of Belgrade. And I found them there in the middle of the night. And some of them were in pretty poor state. They'd, um, they'd been involved in a, an accident, a traffic accident, essentially, where the, the truck they'd been traveling in had overturned on a hillside. And a lot of them had relatively minor injuries, like broken ankles and broken wrists and so on. Nobody was in a life-threatening situation. But uh, anyway, so I... These were all members of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. They were the British members of the UN troops. Anyway, they got out. That was a small plus in an otherwise pretty grim summer involving things like Srebrenica. Yes. And you also wrote, more often than not, we fail to read him correctly. Why was that? I think initially we, we thought that what he said was what he meant. And very obviously, it became quite clear that very often what he said bore no relation to what was really happening. He was able to, particularly in the early days of when I knew him, he was quite capable of saying black was white, and denying blankly something that was going on that I knew he was responsible for. I remember having a conversation with him about Kosovo once where he told me that Kosovo had never been as peaceful as it was now. And I said to him, well, actually, I was there last week, Mr. President, and I can tell you that I think you've been sadly misinformed by some of your assistants and officials because the situation is anything but peaceful. It's actually tinder dry. And if you don't do something to help solve it, it's going to create a new international crisis. This was after the Bosnian crisis was over. But, you know, he was in a state of denial, whether it was because he had fooled himself or whether he thought he was fooling me. But that's the sort of thing where you have to aim off for what he said and try and read what was really in his mind. Yeah, which is extremely difficult when someone isn't yeah. giving yes. you anything. Um, yes. In doing my research, I asked Andrew Valio, who is a much respected financier and thinker about this topic. And his question was, talking about Kosovo, wouldn't the Kosovo campaign on the one hand have amplified Putin's security concerns and on the other been fundamental in creating the precedent for Putin to invade Ukraine? What he's basically saying is that the uh, NATO involvement in Kosovo, which we recognize as part of Serbia, and we 
we bombed it and bombed Serbia to create different facts on the ground where the Yugoslav Serbian army withdrew from the province of Kosovo completely. But that was a form of invasion and it was an example of NATO without international authority taking um, aggressive military action. That's how Putin would describe it. Putin himself wasn't in power at the time. It was it was um, Boris Yeltsin, Russian president at the time. But uh, I mean, the Russians hated what happened in in terms of NATO's bombing campaign and were strongly opposed to it. But it wasn't, of course, till recently that Putin was able to use it as a stick with which to beat NATO. Um, the parallels are nowhere near exact, of course. The, the people in Kosovo were 90% uh, Albanian in origin and welcomed NATO's intervention, whereas it's roughly the reverse in Ukraine, I think, where 90% of the population deeply resented and hated Putin's invasion. But um, that's, I think, the answer to the question. Yes. Um, and I think you said at the end of your book that your view was to continue to negotiate? I think there was still room to negotiate. Uh, I'd left Yugoslavia by the time the Kosovo war started. I mean, it was very much heading downhill and I was sent back, um, as I think I mentioned in the book. Yes, you do. Twice as a secret envoy to see Milosevic to try and warn him of the impending catastrophe that would befall him if he didn't withdraw his troops. But I do think one could have made a greater effort. And I think the peace conference in um, Paris, in Rambouillet, I think it was handled in a way that was as destined to lead to a failure of the negotiation and the bombing of Kosovo and Serbia. I didn't think it had to be that way. Well, before we leave Yugoslavia, you say that you hope your book shed some light on why the former Yugoslavia died in agony. And with the benefit of hindsight, how could it have been different? Well, I think if you look at the example of uh, Czechoslovakia, which is another product of the Versailles Peace Conference of 1919, they had a velvet divorce. They decided, you know, actually they didn't have a lot in common, at least not enough in common to want to stay together. They both agreed. They both parted. They're both now happy members of the European Union. Uh, and you know, not a shot was fired in anger. If you look at Yugoslavia, as it was in uh, at the end of the Second World War, and it, it was uh, comprised people who were never likely to be able successfully to live together. One group tended to get into the ascendant and tried to oppress the other. While President Tito was around, he just suppressed everyone. They all loved him because they, they felt that he was, you know, he gave them international prestige because he parted company from the Soviet Union dramatically and cut his ties with Stalin. He was seen by the West as an attractive third way between outright communism and Western capitalism. We, the West, invested a lot of money in Yugoslavia price we were happy to pay to keep Yugoslavia out of the Warsaw Pact and out of um, the Soviet sphere of influence. But when, of course, the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union dissolved, Yugoslavia's terms of trade altered dramatically and for the worse. And suddenly, there was no point in paying large sums of money to keep them out of the Soviet Union sphere of influence because there wasn't a Soviet Union Anyway, so they found themselves in the middle of a big financial crisis, and this led to endless tensions between the different republics, who started off not having a lot of time for each other anyway, in many respects. Uh, and without Tito's restraining hand, bickering between them started to get very acute. And those countries, which were indeed the former Habsburg countries, Croatia and Slovenia, thought that it was the time to jump ship. Uh, and uh, successfully organized that in a way which left Bosnia feeling very exposed. 
Bosnia itself was a kind of mini Yugoslavia because it had Muslims, Croats, and Serbs uh, mix all mixed in together. And the idea of staying in a Yugoslavia, which by then would be dominated by Serbia, was not one that the Muslims welcomed. And so they opted to get out. Serbia, the Serbs in Bosnia said, you can't go without our consent, which was the terms of a kind of constitutional arrangement, but that was ignored. And uh, the Bosnian Serbs boycotted a referendum. The referendum passed an independence vote, and they were quickly recognized. And uh, that led to the complete fragmentation of Yugoslavia and only carried on further with the departure of Kosovo and indeed Macedonia and uh, Montenegro. Anyone who tries to reduce the Balkan crisis to simple terms is going to risk getting into the great, great confusion. I think the overall message I say is that it wasn't going to survive as a unitary country, but it didn't have to break up in blood and violence. And just while we're sort of talking about Karadzic and Mladic and Milosevic and Praliak, they were all tried for war crimes. Any war crimes that are committed in the war with Ukraine, will anyone be able to be brought to justice because the tribunal into the war crimes was established by a UN Security Council resolution of which Russia is a veto-wielding member? So they'll never allow that to happen. But are there circumstances under which people could be held to account? Only if they come into the jurisdiction of a country that is a member of the International Criminal Court. If, for the sake of argument, Mr. Putin wandered into France or some, somewhere like that, which is a member of the International Criminal Court, then he would be arrested. The trouble with the International Criminal Court, as opposed to the tribunals that were set up for Yugoslavia and later for Rwanda, is that an awful lot of people failed to sign up, whereas the tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda were endorsed by the UN Security Council and uh, are accepted any, in any country in the world that is a member of the United Nations has to implement what they say. In the case of uh, the International Criminal Court, which uh, would be involved in what's happening in Ukraine, Russia, not a member of the International Criminal Court, China, no, United States, no. You know, these are huge countries. And in the case of China, obviously huge populations as well. Uh, so the jurisdiction isn't going to work. I can't see any circumstances in which Vladimir Putin would be arraigned before a war crimes tribunal, much though that would be desirable. I am thrilled to announce our first sponsor of the show, Hermit London. Hermit London is a sustainable fashion brand repurposing luxury hotel bed linen into one-of-a-kind pyjamas. Hermit started in lockdown 2020 and is built on the discovery that an estimated 10 million tonnes of luxury hotel bed linen ends up in landfill every year in Europe alone. It is being thrown away due to small stains, pools or frays, with an average life cycle of just nine months. Did you know that it takes roughly 12,500 litres of water to produce just one bedsheet? Founder Ella transforms this luxury, often unused waste material into individual, characterful and supremely comfortable pyjamas, giving you that hotel night sleep every night of the week. You can buy her pyjamas and read more about her mission to end textile waste at www.hermitlondon.com. Treat yourself and treat the planet. Let's jump to the Good Friday Agreement, which was signed on the 10th of April, 1998, ending most of the violence in the Troubles in Northern Ireland that had prevailed since the late 1960s. It was a major development in the Northern Ireland peace process of the 1990s, and you were ambassador to Ireland from 99 to 2003, so pretty much right after that agreement was signed. Given Again, <laughs> strong personalities, the sensitivities, the history of violence and animosity. How successful has this been versus your expectations? Well, as someone who, you know, for 
felt like, well, 30 years, an awfully long time. When the troubles started, I'd, I'd just left university. And by the time they ended, I was getting towards the end of my time in the Foreign Office. It was a very, very long time. It was a wonderful breakthrough. However, difficult implementation has been in the intervening period. Overwhelmingly, the violence has stopped. I mean, we're talking about fractional, isolated incidents compared with with uh, what happened in those thirty years. I mean, with one major exception, and I will dwell on it for a moment, which was the bombing at Omar, which took place after the Good Friday Agreement and was the single worst atrocity of the troubles, when I think twenty nine people were killed and two unborn children. And that was the carried out by a renegade splinter group from the provisional IRA who called themselves the real IRA. They were led by someone who'd been a, a port, the quartermaster general of the provisional IRA. So he quite literally, A, knew where all the bodies were buried, but more importantly, knew where all the arms were buried. And he was responsible for this um, atrocity. And at the end of my time in Dublin, I ended up giving evidence against him in the special criminal court in Dublin. I gave up my diplomatic immunity to give evidence against him. And he, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for directing terrorism. But that was a terrible incident. But that's the last major incident of its kind. Nothing like that has, has happened in the intervening quarter of a century. And how did you find it being sort of parachuted in? Were things already running smoothly? Things were running well, but not perfectly. There was one major stumbling block that the IRA refused to decommission their weapons. This was something that the Irish government had told the British government would be a step too far for the IRA. And so just you know, accept the fact that they're on permanent ceasefire. and. This troubled the Protestant parties, the Ulster Unionist Party in particular, who were led by a man called David Trimble, who was one of the people who received the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and he became the first minister of the devolved administration in Northern Ireland. But he was constantly being undermined by the fact that the IRA refused to decommission his ability to bring his party with him was constantly being chipped away at. I had made the suggestion, which I still think would have been a sensible one, to have told the IRA that they would get their prisoners released as they decommissioned their weapons. The process would be a mechanical one. But we know roughly what your armory is. When you've decommissioned 5% of it, the first 5% of your prisoners would be released, and so on. It would just be a mechanical process. Anyway, my advice was not accepted by number 10, who believed instead that the Irish government's view, which was that Sinn Féin would never wear it. But my own experience of counter-terrorism led me to believe that the one thing terrorists want above all else is the release of their prisoners. They would have paid a very heavy price to do so. And in fact, years later, they did give up their weapons without any particular linkage. So it just meant that by that stage, David Trimble and his moderate Ulster Unionist Party had been outflanked by Dr. Ian Paisley's more radical Democratic Unionist Party, who are now the largest single Unionist Party in Northern Ireland. So we've now ended up with the, the two centrist elements, the SDLP, the, um, the sort of Labour Party equivalent in Northern Ireland, um, being outflanked by Sinn Féin, and on the other side, the Ulster Unionist Party being outflanked by Paisley's Democratic Unionist Party. And that's led us into the problems we still have over the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol on Brexit and so on, which we've seen in the headlines in recent weeks and months. Yes. Well, your last posting was ambassador in Italy. And last week, 
gosh, actually, maybe I'm maybe I'm a week out. Ex Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi died, and I read your article in the Telegraph about him. And he's been accused of being sexist, a womanizer, politically incorrect, a lover of good food and football, corrupt. How did you find him? Well, I think all those things. Yes, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't That's disagree totally with accurate. Him. Yes, absolutely. He was very funny. He reminded me a bit of, uh, I think it was Amber Rudd who said of Boris Johnson that he was a great person to go to a party with, but you wouldn't want him driving you home afterwards. No. <laughs> and, and, and Berlusconi was someone who, if he was if he was in the room, the place would be rocking with laughter, perhaps politically incorrect jokes, but still very funny. He wasn't really a, a normal politician. He was a showman, and he enjoyed hugely the power that he exercised in politics, but also over women. And he was quite prepared to use money shamelessly to persuade women to attend his highly dubious bunga bunga parties, which um, I'm glad to say I was never at or indeed ever invited to. But I remember he did tell me a very um, a terrible joke once. And uh, when he said he was about to tell me a joke, his, his, his officials got very agitated. I don't know. No, you can't tell that joke to the ambassador. Absolutely not. The more they went on like this, the more determined he was to tell me the joke, which was terrible, awful joke. I've never repeated it to anyone. But when I made a mention in my reporting telegram to the Foreign Office that he told me a blue joke, which, uh, as this was going to be a family-friendly report, I wasn't going to repeat. Uh, my phone never stopped ringing. People <laughs> were determined to find out what it was, but I've, I've still never told anyone, and now I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the 24th of September 2006, which was your 60th birthday, the Observer's Penn Dennis column reported that following your outspoken valedictory report, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office had decided to abandon its centuries-old tradition of allowing departing diplomats to speak their minds. What did you say? Well, I mean, it's it's in the public domain now. Um, oh, I didn't find it. Matthew Paris has got a book called uh, Parting Shots, which is a collection of valedictory dispatches, and mine is in it. And but essentially, my message was that I thought we'd rather lost the plot, that we were more concerned with business speak and uh, management organization than our essential purpose, which was foreign policy advice. And I quoted, and uh, this didn't make me very popular with the hierarchy in the Foreign Office, uh, uh, a story, true story of the of Stalin's commissar for foreign affairs, a man called Maxim Litvinov. And uh, Stalin, I don't know what year now, I think it was the early 30s or might have been the late 20s, asked uh, Litvinov as the Commissar for Foreign Affairs to produce a five-year plan for the ministry. And uh, Litvinov, with what must have been huge personal as well as other kinds of courage, wrote back to Stalin saying, Comrade, I will not be submitting a five-year business plan for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because foreign affairs is not like that. We cannot predict how crises will erupt around the world events which we are unable to control completely beyond our ken, and this would be a nonsense. And I said to the Foreign Office, I suggest you follow the same advice when the Treasury asks you for a five-year plan. So instead of worrying about um, business plans, skills audits, capability reviews, and all the other excrescences of um, Wall Street speak, just get on with providing foreign policy advice. That's what you're there for. Well, that doesn't sound too bad to me. That's why they banned all valedictory dispatches. <laughs> <laughs> well, turning to the present day, and with all the information you've been privy to and with your experience, which nation do you think we should most fear? Well, I think uh, in the short term, Russia, after all, it's led by a, a, someone who is dangerously unstable, who is reckless and ruthless in a way we haven't seen for decades. He has access to the largest nuclear arsenal in the world, and he is in fact not only has access to it, he's in sole control of it. 
I haven't entirely ruled out the prospect of his being willing to use nuclear weapons if he feels that the alternative is his and his country's destruction. He feels that if Russia is defeated in this war, that it will lead to the fragmentation of the whole of Russia. And if Russia is destroyed, he doesn't see it as particularly worse if the world is destroyed. And he's made these sorts of comments, which is very frightening. I fear a Russia under Putin, or indeed any of his immediate acolytes, as I feel that they are a dangerous crew. Some of them, from their comments, are even more reckless than he is. But they can talk big. But it can be fairly meaningless because they don't actually have the power to control nuclear weapons. Only he does at the moment. But if he if he falls for some reason, the people around him are not a bunch of um, liberal Democrats. And I think the day when we can look at uh, normal, progressive, democratic Russia is still a long way off. We all had high hopes of it after the fall of the Soviet Union in the Gorbachev-Yeltsin era. Uh, but that's been completely overshadowed now by the Putin experience. And uh, who knows when we're going to get back, if we're going to get back to something approaching the Yeltsin-Gorbachev era. But on the, in, in another sense, I fear China, because of its huge economic potential and its military might, the way it's increasing its military resources is quite frightening, whether it's ships, submarines, missiles. It's uh, very worrying. And of course, there could be a major showdown over Taiwan. But I don't see that happening in the immediate future. And I don't also think that um, from what President Xi has said, he's been very robust about nuclear activity. And the idea that there should be any use of nuclear weapons is something he regards as anathema. He sticks to that, well, at least that's something. Of all the politicians you've met, which one did you respect the most? The political figure in my own side in British politics, whom I admired most, is, is Lord Carrington, Peter Carrington, who I think um, his decision to resign over the Falklands was the sort of decision which contemporary politicians don't seem capable of taking, it was actually the wrong decision because it wasn't he who should have resigned. It was other people who should have resigned who were responsible for creating the circumstances in which Argentina felt that it was safe for them to go ahead and invade the Falklands. But Peter Carrington, when asked about this, said he felt someone should accept responsibility and nobody else was seemed to think he inclined to do so, so he thought he should. And um, he was a product of his background and generation. He was a man of enormous integrity and, and capacity. I mean, his negotiation over, the, over Zimbabwe, bringing about the peaceful end of, one, of uh, white rule there, was a significant achievement. It was just a tragedy that his career should end in that way over the Falklands. I mean, he had a distinguished career subsequently as a as the Secretary General of NATO. But there's no, pol no political figure whom I admire more than Peter Carrington. What makes a good diplomat? Having met you before, you're a fantastic listener. Hugely important. You need patience, tact, and ability to listen, ability to understand, uh, to be able to read people, coming back to the discussion of Milosevic, but Ability to understand what people's bottom line is, not just what their ostensible demand is, what are their underlying concerns and how can you address those? If you can't move some way to meet their underlying concerns, you're never going to achieve a proper solution to any particular diplomatic problem. So yes, an ability to listen and to interpret what you hear is something probably the most single important thing. And after all this, you could have retired, you could have just, you could have gone back to Vanuatu and done a lot more diving. But instead, you end up in education um, as Master of Trinity College, Oxford. And I guess there's quite a lot of crossover between being ambassador 
and being the head of an Oxford colleges, because there'll be lots of meetings, lots of discussions, negotiations. But aside from the content of what you're discussing, how does the level of consensus, the pace of discussions and timelines differ from one role to the other? It's a bit of a culture shock. I was being an ambassador for my last three jobs. So for 12 years, or thereabouts, I had taken advice from whoever in the embassy I thought could usefully offer me advice on a particular topic, and then I take a decision. And right or wrong, it was my decision. I took it, and we got ahead and did it. Now, in an Oxford college, it doesn't work like that. You put forward your view tentatively. um, You invite other views, and uh, you try crab-like to get the decision-making process to throw up the answer you first put forward. It's painfully slow. And people who know nothing about a particular subject don't feel in any way inhibited from sounding off on it and putting forward their views, even though they may be quite ignorant of how the problem should best be addressed. Oxford dons, by and large, reckon that they know just about everything there is to be known on any subject. They're not shy at bringing forward these views. It could be diplomatically even more challenging than dealing with some of the more recalcitrant figures I've met down the years. But mainly it was it was great, great fun. I did it for 11 years. It's the longest single stint doing the same job I've done in my whole life. Because yes. As, as a, an ambassador or as a diplomat, every four years or so, I was changing country, changing job changing environment, culture, language. But 11 years, always doing the same thing, although the cast changed, the students changed. I think contact with the students, particularly the graduate students, kept on young, very interesting hearing how they're developing. Because Oxford tends to discourage people from taking gap years, you get people coming in straight from school very often as undergraduates. And in a way, you know, sometimes they really don't know anything about anything except what they've done for A level. But within a year, they've, they've blossomed. But that's the first year, I think they can be very quite insular, quite narrow. Uh, whereas the graduates have already been through at least one blossoming experience. And uh, they were particularly rewarding to talk to. I was lucky enough to study there. I was at New College. And my husband's question to you, Simon's question, and that was that there's been an active policy to redress the balance between the independent and state sectors, and that's happening. But at the same time, it appears that a higher proportion of students are being admitted from overseas. His question was, are we doing our students a disservice? I've now been retired from um, Trinity College six years. But basically, the overwhelming number of our students at undergraduate level were from the UK probably 90%. And we certainly were never looking to recruit overseas students to bulk out the fees. So the balance between state and public sector, it was interesting because I I was at a grammar school, or actually not quite a grammar school, something called a direct grant school, which was more or less like a grammar school. If you passed the 11 plus, you went paid no fees. But they also took in a small number of people who failed the 11 plus, but they were paid fees and got in. But by and large, most nearly everyone there had passed the 11 plus. And the proportion of grammar school, therefore state educated students at Oxford in the 60s, was very high. And I think the abolition of the grammar schools was a disaster from the point of view of the social mobility that the grammar schools were able to bring. It's much harder now. One of the things I argued for at Oxford was for a kind of foundation year for those who were poor state schools, poor in the sense of not very good, because it does the students a disservice if you admit people who you think have been so, so poorly taught, they're going to really struggle, but you know they deserve a chance. And they may get very demoralized if they find they can't write, can't write essays, they, they're not trained to think. So a foundation year seemed to me a good way of of dealing with that, of encouraging people from underperforming state schools 
but with real potential to come and spend a year and then to sit the Oxford entrance exams, having had the benefit of that. And that, I think, is now increasingly being considered, but it wasn't being considered when I was at uh, Trinity. I think the important thing is that there should be no discrimination, that we should always be looking for the children with the most potential to benefit from an Oxford education. And if it's from the state sector or private sector, it should be indifferent. In terms of overseas students, the bulk of graduates come from overseas. They're about, I think the last time I looked at the figures, they're around 60%, maybe a bit more from overseas. But that's perfectly understandable that for graduates, I mean, I, if I had a place at Harvard to do a second degree, for instance, which I unfortunately wasn't allowed to take up. The Foreign Office didn't think that this was a useful way of my indulging my, <laughs> myself. Um, but you know, I, I would want it to be an experience in an education in another country, and I think that's a very common experience. And a lot of international students want to come to Oxford to do a second degree and a master's or a doctorate, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. They pay high fees, but no higher than I would have had to pay at Harvard or something unless I got a scholarship. So I think there is that distinction. I think it's I think it's right that a British university should overwhelmingly educate uh, British students for the for their first degree. And that's what we do. Iwa, thank you so much. And I know there are lots of things that we haven't had time to discuss because we haven't talked about the books that you've written on diplomatic practice. But I'm just going to end up with the, the famous French diplomat, Talleyrand, advisor to Napoleon. He remarked, a diplomat who says yes means maybe, a diplomat who says maybe means no, and a diplomat who says no... Is no, no diplomat. <laughs> is no <laughs> diplomat, which you know in spades. <laughs> so... <laughs> But you've demonstrated so beautifully what an asset you've been to our country and goodness me, the work that you've done on all our behalf. So, so grateful to you for sharing your thoughts with us all today. Thank you so, so much, Iva. Thank you so much. It's been a huge pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Bandwidth Conversations. Thanks to Anna B, Head of Marketing, to Matthew Passy and all of the podcast consultant, to Bagawai for the music, to the Money Maze podcast. Thank you for listening. Any feedback, please email me, katie at bandwidthconversations.com. Please sign up on our website, www.bandwidthconversations.com, so we can notify you about new podcast releases. We hope to see you again soon. <laughs>